What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to Fudge Muppet. My name is Scott, here with Michael and Drew. As always, this is the Elder Scrolls Podcast, and today we are talking about one member of the Tribunal, Sotha Sil, specifically today. Yes, the mainspring ever wound, the father of mysteries, the magician, the teacher, the sorcerer, the tinkerer, the clockwork god, the light of knowledge. He has many names. I could keep going, but I think I'll stop there. And more importantly, he has the name Set, which we'll probably use to refer to him at some point in this podcast, seeing as it's easier to say than Sotha Sil. And uh, if, I was just going to say a, a little point about Set there. It's like, it's literally just the letter S in the Daedric alphabet. Same mm. as I A M and same as uh, for, uh, Vec. Mm. But yeah. Mm-hmm. So... Who wants to start us off on Sotha Sil? I mean, I, he tends to keep to himself, doesn't he? He probably doesn't really want us talking about him too much. But at the same time, his followers are quite fanatical to the point where, obviously, they come up with all these names for him. So he's an interesting character because he's very reclusive. And, you know, you have periods of time where you have Helsa, for example, saying we haven't seen him in centuries or heard from him. Um, yet he's been keeping himself quite busy in the Clockwork City, which... Thanks to ESO, we have much greater understanding of than we used to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He's, got he's a, a very, he's a very intelligent, um, mm. and very intelligent character. That's kind of his shtick. If you look at the tribunal when they became gods, um, he basically became hyper, hyper intelligent, kind of like a, kind of like the Iron Man of the Elder Scrolls universe in a way. Yeah, well, uh, with all these gadgets <clears throat> and different things. Um, but before all of that happened, he was not a god, obviously. Um, he was simply Sotha Sil of Ald Sotha, which was a small place in Morrowind. And House Sotha, um, kind of not a great house, obviously, a small and insignificant house, kind of presided over Old Sotha. And he lived quite a peaceful life there with his family. He's, we don't really hear about his dad, I don't think, but his sister is there, his mom, and, and some sort of nanny character is there. And he has a close relationship with his sister, uh, Sotha Nal. Yeah, and just to clarify for people to remember that, especially in ancient Kaima sort of stuff, they do the kind of Japanese thing where you have the last name come first. So that's why really like it's uh, Almalexia's full name even is Indoral Almalexia, who was married to Indoral Nerevar, but that's the house name coming first. So Soth is Sil. So Sil is actually just his like first name. It's very played up that he has a somewhat sheltered early life and not really a kind of male figure to potentially push him down a warrior path it's very much you know that about as violent as he'll get is throwing rocks at kwama and things like that and which end up becoming proverbs in in Mm -hmm. tribunal society but the idea is very much that he's more of a thinker than a than a a warrior and there's also lots of little tiny stories about his um, treatment of other creatures and sort of like concern he he sort of has like a bit of a a mercy and and a sort of care which is funny because that's what's out of the tribunal, the mother of Mercy, Almalexia, that's sort of what is attributed to her most. But, and we'll also see throughout his dialogue and further discussion as we go, but he does have a sort of um, altruistic kind of goal. Like even the Clockwork City and its entire design is a purpose of, of creating a sort of perfected Tamriel, a better one, a better Mundus, a better place. He, inst- he sees, and this goes into his sort of analytical kind of like tinkering kind of nature, but he... Everywhere he looks, he sees imperfections and he kind of wants to perfect them for for the good of everyone. It's kind of his shtick. And he'll never be satisfied either. He has that Mm. very like um, ambition is obviously something that benefits him a lot, but it's also something that pains him. And so is his sense of determinism as well. Because if you listen to the things that he says, he very much believes um, that fate exists in the sense that it's just a chain of of cause and effect of actions and consequences and that he has no choice but to do what he's doing um, and to kind of build the clockwork city and perhaps not even achieve what he set out to do but he knows he can't change that yeah the the, the quote is like um, when the vestige of your character in ESO asks about it he says but asks about him who are you really or whatever you expect something grand, but I promised you the truth. I am only what time and circumstances made me, son of a lost house, friend to a fallen king. Some will, you, some will tell you that we are the product of our choices. I've never th- found that to be the case. And like, but 
you're supposed to be a god, right? He says, I'm whatever the people need me to be, a guardian, an oppressor, for some too distant, for others too meddlesome. I'm the canvas upon which they paint their dreams and resentments, a vessel for their hopes and doubts, a mirror, nothing more. Mm -hmm. It's interesting too when he talks about Almalexia and his kind of belief in determinism actually makes him more forgiving of others' flaws because he understands that just like him, they are also bound to a chain of cause and effect. And I believe, so he says, when you ask him, um, what are your feelings on Almalexia? He basically says she defies simple analysis. I doubt she could even describe herself accurate, accurately. Oh, interestingly, actually, you were talking um, before about how some, uh, some of the tribunal actually seem to exemplify traits that you'd think the other ones would have more. Um, but Sothisil actually says, to understand Almalexia, you must first understand the value of fiction. Vivek fancies himself the poet, but in truth, A.M. is the greatest storyteller. Um, but anyway, when, she, when you talk about Almalexia and how she's different, um, and he talks about how her capacity for deception appears limitless, and she can just sow, you know, lies like a master gardener sows seeds... Um, he says it doesn't bother him. He says, not in the slightest. As I said, we are all of us bound by our nature. Almalexia does what she does because she cannot do otherwise. It will not end well, but then even the best endings rarely bring joy. So he seems very aware um, mm -hmm. that everyone kind of has their own nature. And, and to him, he believes that they're, they're kind of bound within it. Although there is an interesting quote at the end of it where he, he kind of admits a... Uh, I guess a, a character flaw in himself that there's like a cage and that he, where I, I'll find well, the quote about the cage. So it basically starts talking about, um, there's this idea of the prisoner and that's the like motif in all the Elder Scrolls games. You sort of start off as a prisoner or something. Or, but or he's like, the prisoner too difference. within yeah. Clockwork City and his own fate. Yeah. So, um, one of the questions you can ask him, he, he refers to you as the prisoner and you say like, why do you keep calling me prisoner? He says, a fool's hope, perhaps. I should explain. Look around you. All of this exists because it must exist. I stand here in this place, in this moment, not because I wish to, but because I have to. A result of action and consequence. So wouldn't that make you the prisoner? Clever, but incorrect. The prisoner must apprehend two critical insights. First, they must face the reality of their imprisonment. They must see the determinative walls, the chains of causality that bind them to their course. You haven't done that, you ask? Uh, I have, but I fall short of the second insight. The prisoner must see the door to their cell. They must gaze through the bars and perceive that which exists beyond causality, beyond time. Only then can they escape. Mm -hmm. You don't see the door. He responds, I see only unsteady walls. If the people of Tamriel must exist inside this cell, I will make sure the walls are stable. The gaps are sealed and all who remain stay safe within. Yeah, um, it, it, it's interesting that because it's almost as if he, he acknowledges that determinism essentially is the way he sees the world. And yet then he says that it's actually possible to see that which exists beyond causality, but he can't. Because in his story, he's trapped to his journey of basically making sure the, the, the walls or the cage is um, perfected. So there, there is some really like meta stuff here. And it's similar with the whole idea like Vivek being aware of he's an NPC or being part of a dream, all that kind of stuff. But there is this motif a few times of, of this idea of the prisoner being a being of free will, aka you, the person playing the game, has free will over the actions. But the NPCs, aka Sotha, Silver, Vec, all of the people contained within the game can't determine their own actions. So basically, you know, the whole concept of the Elder Scrolls prophecies too and the Elder Scrolls, how they're like you know, moving and shifting and changing. They can't solely be read. There are these elements of of free choice that exists sort of outside of the realm of causality. And you could even say that this is sort of the myth-making of the player when you create your own character, your own backstory and all that kind of stuff. But you're seeing beyond the cell walls outside the realm of causality, like what's supposed to happen. And you are, you know, enforcing your own myths onto the world or so on. It gets pretty like... Uh, meta like that, but it is another call out to um, to that sort of similar idea. Like it's, uh, he says at the last thing, I've met few heroes like you, very few. I take this matter of the triad upon myself, but in truth, you may be the one that saves us, the prisoner who frees the world. We shall see farewell or whatever. But it's it's kind of a the, the prison bars are a bit of a metaphor for what he's trying to create in this final Tamriel anyway. It's like plugging the holes and the 
the imperfections that the Aedra left behind because he very much his goal is very Anuic in the sense that he wants to achieve something close to Anu's ineffability um, but it's kind of impossible you know with Jiglag he says he went mad in the knowing trying to implement his determinism but in this world he wants to create the Aedra are not perfect because they sought counsel from Lorcan. they sought counsel from the Padamaic force of chaos and and inherently anything created by them would be full of flaws and that's what he's trying to create here and i think it's an interesting thing that he uses terms like scott you mentioned it before where he calls himself a canvas a vessel or a mirror but he talks extensively or one of his acolytes does about the idea that he tries to avoid the nimic so the nimic being the kind of the the true name of something that gives you power over it like mayrun's dagon was banished from battle spire because the player character i forget his name now um, rem like knows the name of Dagon and is able to to banish him because of it. But but what Set is trying to create is this nameless will. Like the will of the Clockwork City is supposed to ascend beyond him, so that if he disappears, it can continue. He can't really put his name on it, otherwise it makes it weak. Which is why he calls it the nameless will. Yeah. Um, to I've got there's there's a quote here as well. I just sort of want to add to that too, where he, where you if you ask him, so you were forced to build the Clockwork City, he says compelled. Um, the city serves a noble goal: the redemption of Tamriel, the unification of competing forces, the destruction of the Daedra. Unfortunately, it's an endeavor built upon a lattice of corpses, betrayal, untold horrors. Do you understand? Anyway, that said, there's also the talk of him. Um, saying that he's a mirror to things but there what i see the unification of competing forces is obviously it's kind of talking about like the fundamentally anu padme like you were saying like making he's very anuic in that sort of sense um but another concept i think people would just like if we talked about it um but there is this concept in the elder scrolls called the enantiomorph which and an enantiomorph is a real thing and it's basically a mirror image the easiest way to explain it to someone i think would be like um your right hand and left hand there it's an enantiomorph it's a mirror image of one another or something like that and then could you think of it as like one of those ink spot things where you mm -hmm. fold the page in half and open it yeah yeah that, that, that too um but so what i sort of see from his goal there is like the clockwork is the idea of um uniting making no mirror like kind of un uniting those two forces and solving the sort of enantiomorph problem by the way also just i'll probably make a video at one point about the enantiomorph uh, in more in depth because people have heard things like um the rebel uh, the idea of there's this rebel king and witness or thief warrior mage sort of dynamic with you know the three um heads of talos you know wolf Arth and so on and then all the tribunal law with Nerevar and Alandra Saul and so on. It gets complicated, but there's this, it really is sort of like a, it's a bit of a nebulous idea that sort of exists in, in the Elder Scrolls sort of lore community of people that, you know, like theorizing about this stuff like, like we do. So it's mm -hmm. interesting, not necessarily super related, but I, I, I think there's some insight to be gained to his role in trying to, um, mm. you know. It's, well, it's interesting to think in destroying the Daedra, <clears throat> just how kind of biased that is. Because if we go back to his story when he was young and living in um, old Sotha and going around with his sister, who at one point we know made him go to some forbidden area. She was a bit of a rebellious one, kind of encouraging him to act out. But um, for reasons unknown, obviously it could have something to do with that. But I must say in the law, for reasons unknown, Mehrun's Dagon comes to old Sotha and basically rains down fire and kills everyone. Um, and old so and sorry, Sotha still is saved uh, by Vivek. The lone survivor. As well, the lone survivor thing. as well which is interesting later on you hear him want to what well, he wants to destroy the daedra it's like well no wonder despite his philosophical mm. reasoning you know having some um consistency to it it makes sense but it's just funny that that's the path he went down there's a night there's a nice quote that um where he where sothasil um when he's talking to azura after he's just sort of given himself divinity along with his uh buddies uh, it says, the old gods are cruel and arbitrary and distant from the hopes and fears of Mer. Your age is past. We are the new gods, born of flesh and wise and caring of the needs of our people. Spare us your threats and chiding, inconstant spirit. We are bold and fresh and we will not fear you. See, also calling him out as inconstant. So I, I, I think it's it's important that I think with Sofa Seal, he would have had absolutely no regrets about usurping this power whatsoever. So while Almalexia and Vivek were actually a little afraid when it happened... He seemed very determined about it. So there's a lot of references mm. in the Truth in Sequence about 
in order to to create the perfect thing in order to be able to do it right you have to dismantle the old like cleaning an old clock you dismantle it you you clean it you oil it and then you put it back together so that's very much what they're doing by usurping the role of the good daedra because obviously he sees the padamite forces as kind of just chaotic and flawed and and that's not what he's trying to achieve and then it might be from the same text or the other account of red mountain but it says the Dunmer were at first afraid of their new faces, but Sofasil spoke to them, saying that it was not a curse but a blessing, a sign of their changed natures, and sign of the special favour they might enjoy as new myrrh, no longer barbarians trembling before ghosts and spirits, but civilised myrrh, speaking directly to their immortal friends and patrons, the free faces of the tribunal. And um, so it's like the idea that they will be on par with the people, the people can, can use him, but also that in order for him to have the power to create what he's trying to create, they had to tear down the old. So so having the Dunma people um, c go through this complete change was essential, and I think it's also why he chooses to maintain the Dunma appearance, even though he could continue to look like a Kaima, is that yeah. he, mm. he sees this extremely scary change as a very good thing. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's kind of like a move of solidarity, I suppose, and, with and we the people as well. Mm. We should probably also just, um, just for people who don't know too, um, in most of the stories, Sothasil's the one that uses Kagranak's tools and studies the heart. And he's the one who basically divines the way like, oh, we can make, you know, um, use the heart of Lorcan to become gods essentially. And also you've got to establish the difference between like theoretically, those kinds of ideas are somewhat heretical, like to the tribunal, you know, that, that the Dunma people at large are told the sort of 36 lessons of Vivek sort of style of things or, or basically like, you know, sort of divine conception or they were so good that they rose in power because of their just, mm -hmm. they were just superhuman, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, well, but yes. Yeah. Uh, just quickly about the heart, one, one thing that's, that kind of ties back to you talking about the enantiomorph and the idea of kind of like the mirror image is that in order for him to actually work on creating this clockwork city, the the real Nur needs to be intact. It needs to continue working. The heart of Lorcan is essential in order to achieve this goal until he can create a mirror version of it, his own mechanical heart to use as a new power source in the event that the heart of Lorcan ceases to power them, which is a yeah. big part of his conflict with Almalexia that probably meant that he, you know, he knew it was inevitable that she would turn because she would panic in the face of the loss of the heart whereas he's trying to find a mirror image of it that can be used in its place. A solution, yeah. yeah. And it's yeah. something that only he would understand as well. S mm. something, to, something to point out too that's actually kind of interesting. If you look at that, it's a probably... I'll, I'll put it up on screen, but there's a picture of... Um, of uh, the Elms of E, it's a concept art. It's a pretty classic one, but you'll actually notice inside of his sort of like the mechanical sort of Sotha sill on the right that there's actually a little baby inside of him and it's a reference to like basically in the 37th sermon of Avec, um it does say this which was that one added on in Elder Scrolls Online that also references Coda and so on but three in some the robes of AM stretched towards the black rim of memory roping in an arc of purchase this was a new sprinting task and Set held his swollen belly to its name clockmaker's daughter swimming the dead confession along a century of thread naming her um, uneaten a golden cache of Veloth and Velothi for El for where else would they go? And then it says, go here, world without wheel, charting zero deaths and echoes singing, Set said, until all of it was done and the center was anything, whatever. But that's actually, that world without charting is actually www.coda, if you take the first letter of each of the things, um, .es. But anyway, it's the kind of, uh, at least the way I'm sort of thinking about it at the moment, I might have to think deeper about it. But the idea is the sort of, this sort of, I don't know if that's the baby thing is a metaphor for the clockwork city or so on or, or, or whatnot. Um, but this whole idea of this clockmaker's daughter and the sort of a golden cache of Veloth and Velothi, it's like a place where they're going to take them and move on. It kind of relates to sort of the Codas story with Amaranth and um, them becoming the, the new man and escaping the, the dream in another way. But probably needs uh, an actual video to like organize those thoughts correctly yeah well there's the idea but, that even after his death the clockwork city i mean it's it's kind of up in the air but continues on um so yeah what specifically well it does continue 
it does continue to the fourth era. Yeah. It's the, yeah. And, but then there's... And whether or not, yeah, it can continue to live on. It, it, it almost seemed like his work was unfinished, but he was trying to make it, you know, live on past him eternally. Yeah. So, so um, to recap for everyone, basically, uh, especially when... Sothisil's story going, he, he was once, you know, more involved with the Dunmer and so on, but he kind of grew distant from them in time and more obsessed with his work and the Clockwork City. Um, and especially when he was cut off from the, they were cut off from the heart of Lorcan by Dagothur, when Dagothur returned, he started seeking a new solution, which was creating this mechanical heart in the Clockwork City. Now, he was never alive to see its finishing, but he had automatons and, and, and such, his like little inventions and so on, to continue the construction of it. And then by the year 200, and one of the fourth era, it's like completed. Now the clockwork apostles, they're basically his closest followers and they sort of love his pursuit of um, of a sort of perfection of a divinity. They'll even replace their own flesh parts with like, you know, more perfect clockwork parts and so on. Um, but they're essentially Sothisil's disciples, his, well, apostles. Um, anyway, they, um, they're continuing on and they've been existing in... in uh, Sothisil's death and so on. They kind of continue to live in the Clockwork City and try and keep it functioning. But the mechanical card gets finished and basically in the events of the Elder Scrolls uh, Legends chapter, there's sort of this, um, I forgot his name, but he's like a bad guy who tries and uses the power for himself of the heart and so on and you're quested mm-hmm. to stop it and so on. But the point is that it's an open-ended thing where the, basically the heart was, uh, the mechanical heart, which was complete, is destroyed or um, it continues on and keeps Clockwork City alive. And that's all left up in the air at the moment. And I don't know if we'll ever really I mean, know for sure. There's an interesting discussion to have there, which I haven't really thought too much about, but um, there are a lot of parallels obviously drawn to the Dwemer. But it, it does seem like when you're describing the the role of his kind of or clockwork automatons, it, they function very differently to the Dwemer philosophy. It, it does seem like the Dwemer were more interested in breaking free from this and essentially showing they had the power of gods and then, you know, what all like, all comes of that. And then the automatons, once they're gone, once they're not serving the Dwemer, have absolutely no purpose whatsoever. Whereas what Sophocle is trying to create is, you know, they're working towards one goal um, that, yeah. that's, that's got nothing to do with him or any other individual. Mm. It, it is quite an interesting invention, these automatons. They're called factotums. Mm. And they're basically these mechanical constructs that he has there that, that take on a humanoid appearance. Um, and you can see them in Elder Scrolls Online and they do all kinds of things. I mean, you see some playing as bards, cleaning, other maintenance related things. Um, but they're all basically there to help the Clockwork City function. The, what I find quite interesting about them is actually that there's this little theory that Sothisil put the voice of, or put the soul of his sister into them to create them. Um, because you, you can find a uh, dialogue from the factotums when they break. And basically it says, um, let me just find it. So clockwork apostles have theorized the factotums voices were that of Sothanal um, due to verbal artifacts, such as if they just say burning beds, screaming, um, and things like that, basically things that you could guess would be her final memories before she was killed when Mayrun Stagon came to Old Sotha. And um, you also see that he has preserved uh, a memory of his uh, dead sister in the Clockwork City. And I think there's even a little writing somewhere by him um, saying how... Oh, I forget yeah, what it is, it's but something pl- about it being preserved. Do you have it's it? It's the plaque underneath that sort of says... Um, a soul that deserved transcendence. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you can see he's like, he's really fond of his sister and so on. Actually, there is a, actually, I actually forgot where it is. It's uh, somewhere about a, a quote where he, he references doing something for her. And I'm pretty sure it's in reference to his sister, but it's not explicit when he says mm. it. It's when I think it's about the Clockwork City. Um, I'm just trying to... Yeah, hold on. He's got but a lot yeah, of when they malfunction too and start saying that, they get sent to like be destroyed or repaired or something like that. So they need- yeah, he's quite clearly not able to completely remove his own kind of biases from his creations. It's not you know purely the work of the the tinkerer creator, but there's there's an element of himself that goes into all his creations. 
Yeah. yeah. Which is kind of like something that theoretically you'd think he would try to avoid, but that's it's somewhat maybe even Azura's nature that kind of seeps into him, that there's always going... When you have that kind of power, that kind of ability to create stuff, um, you're going to have... There's going to be some vanity involved. Well, well that's, that's something interesting to talk about is that he is, you know... Um, related to Azura and how much vanity he actually shows because as we were kind of quickly talking about before the podcast started it seems like there's kind of conflicting sources about Sothisil when it comes to his vanity and it may have been something that and I wouldn't be surprised that was more present but as he became more reclusive and more obsessed with you know building this mechanical heart and focusing solely on making the clockwork city as good as he can um, that his ego lessened. But when you talk to him in the Elder Scrolls Online and you actually say to him, oh, but you're supposed to be a god, right? He just says, I am whatever the people need me to be, a guardian and oppressor for some too distant, yeah. for others too meddlesome. I am the canvas upon which they paint their dreams and resentments, a vessel for their hopes and doubts, a mirror, nothing more. Then if you go, if you believe that, why even call yourself a god? He says, I don't. But my companions, Vivek and Ormalexia, see their divinity as essential. Godhood brings them joy and purpose. They find meaning in the theatrical. Who am I to, to deprive them of that? But then, as you were saying, um, Drew, there are some quotes where he seems to be a bit more full of himself as, a, as this godlike figure. Well, even look at him at the start when he's giving the finger to Azura. is like, yeah, we're yeah. the new gods, yeah, we're the flesh yeah. and so on. And, and another thing to actually throw out there, um, you could... So, because you, like you mentioned... Um, it's useful to look at the anticipations, uh, okay, the three good Daedra of the tribunal to help like get uh, more clarity on sort of the dynamics and so on. But Azura is obviously very vain. There's a lot of vanity in there and beauty and so on. And there's a big sense of like ego, you know, love me, love me, love me kind of thing. But one thing you could argue is that Sothisil has somewhat like the equivalent of a white savior complex. You know, that sort of idea that like, oh, I'm coming to save you. I'm so great. But it's like, oh, it's you can somewhat kind of go, I'm going to create the perfect clockwork city and I have to do this and this is my mission or something. And, and it's for everyone and all this kind of stuff. But it's it's still at the end of the day, whether people want it, like you were sort of saying, some people think it's too distant, too, too meddlesome or whatever. And, you know, he can only be him and do his thing. But you could argue that perhaps there is a little bit of that complex in the same way when he started. He's like, you know, we're the new gods. And, you know, um, you know, people take pride in it, all this kind of stuff. He's like, I'm here to save you all. I'm kind, here to kind perfect of like the, world. the the humanitarian who's really full of themselves that they are, you know, yeah, humanitarian. A humanitarian. I mean, obviously, if someone's doing good in the world, all the power to them. But there is a difference between those who um, basically in the same way he's saying that Almalexia and Vivek, you know, really enjoy the theatrics of being a god. His ego might love the fact that he's not doing that. Yeah. That he he identifies so strongly with the, oh, I'm just this great, you know, helper to the world and I don't need praise, but secretly loves to say I don't need praise and things, yeah. of, you know. I, I wonder Who if knows? he sees the irony in, in kind of what he is trying to achieve. Because, that, you know, there's a line that says, of the Daedra, only the Grey Prince of Order knew his nature, and he went mad in the knowing. But it's like, d does Sofacil kind of understand that what he is trying to achieve is something in that vein that can... Like, the way I see it, um, the Almalexia has a... I mean, the, yeah, this this ties into it a little bit, but Almalexia says after after killing him... I believe he grew weary of mortal imperfections and retired to his clockwork city where he reshapes life and some say the very world into an image he finds pleasing. It's like in, in trying to pursue something, it could be simply that he was trying to pursue something he found pleasing, but if he's trying to pursue something perfect where mortals are in any way involved in this, it's just impossible. I, I feel like mm. there's a flaw in his logic altogether where he sees... Anu cre like creating the Padamaic force to reflect upon itself is in some way a mistake, but you can't have mortals. He would never have been born without this chaos, and you can't really create a realm where this chaos is completely removed unless you remove all mortality and you just have factotums. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, even if you look at Clockwork City... There are flaws to it. It's not perfect. Mm -hmm. I think the easiest way to see it is not a replicated version of, of Tamriel or Nern, but a, a refined version, mm -hmm. um, you know, an enhanced version in, in, in some ways. But there are there is even a class system, um, arguably, that developed when he has been, you know, so reclusive and the apostles are still out there. But there are the lower classes 
I think they're called the Tarnished, and they li live in... They live in some... Was it Slag Town? It sounded very Borderlands related when I heard it, but... <laughs> um, yeah, there, there are lower classes there. There are merchants there and, and different people who, like any city, kind of like keep it running. But things aren't perfect. And it's funny, speaking of vanity, these apostle characters, they tend to be quite full of themselves despite being mortals. Mm. You know, they hang off every word Sothisil says and see themselves as kind of like his chosen ones and... Well, well fun all the rest funnily of Funnily enough, I think this is the her quote you were looking for before. But talking yeah. about the imperfections, there's a line where he says, I saw the imperfection in I saw the imperfections in everything I ever attempted, even imperfections in my pursuit to rid myself of them, which seems mm. exactly like the problems with the clockwork city. And he goes on to say, Yet I could never stop tinkering, I could never stop creating, I loved her too much. Yeah, um, that's the one. I will give no instruction to you who have already come to know love. So it does seem that there are very personal reasons for the philosophy he's developed. We'll even look at it. So I, I, the way I interpret that is all of this, a lot of this is for like his sister. It's sort of, you can imagine a perfection, perfected world where a daedra a being of chaos doesn't come and destroy your entire family and everything and take away your sister and all that. She deserved a perfect world. So he wants to create that. And also he even say when he goes like, you know, the redemption of Tamriel, the unification of competing forces, the destruction of the daedra, he does have a little thing like mm -hmm. screw the daedra. Like he does, he is very anuic in that sort of a perfect, do you know what I mean? Like he wants to create mm -hmm. his, and so in a way you could look at that, that, you know, even in that quote, the Clockwork City is a self-satisfaction thing too. It is not purely just this altruistic thing. It's, do you know what I mean? Like it's kind of It's a... escapism to the max. I don't know hmm. if he's the Elder Scrolls Iron Man anymore or the Elder Scrolls Zuckerberg making the metaverse. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's, just gonna, he's just gonna put on his VR goggles and live in there forever. I mean, even the Clockwork City itself, I believe in one of your videos, Drew, you were saying it's, it's like the size of a netch. Mm. Um, you know, it's mm. all confined to this one little thing and you need to shrink yourself to get inside it. Um, but obviously you, you couldn't make or, or use a portal or the band that Almalexia used to get in there. But um, yeah, it's just interesting. You couldn't fit that world in, Nern. Yeah, it has no place. So you needed to, like a computer almost, you know, fit data or, you know, life in as the t most tiny compressed form possible. It's the cloud. He's just, it's, you know, it's it, something that doesn't exist in any one location. It's just, yeah. <laughs> but I guess that that's it, what's sim a little bit similar to the Sijiks. Um, You know, he obviously has a great respect for them and he's spent time there and he's taught new students and stuff. But he's very much, it seems that he's focused on the idea that high elves in general, but the Sijiks focus too much on the old ways. They look back too much where he's kind of more looking forward and, and mm. seeing potential rather than how to retrace their steps. Yeah, a, a lot of his realm actually reminds me of the, uh, well, uh, trigger warning for Mass Effect fans, but the three endings with all the colors that you can choose between red, green. I don't know. Mm. The, I don't <laughs> oh, know don't, the they're not even spoilers. <laughs> red, green, and blue tells you nothing. But basically the concept of um, like symbiosis and there are these fabricant creatures with their... Um, Basically, they're part bio, like biological with like grown flesh and then they have metallic graphs and stuff, but then they're powered by like soul gems um, and they basically emulate all kinds of Tamrielic life forms like, you know, basilisks or mud crabs or um, spiders. And there's just, it's his world is very um, interesting where he's even making the animals better or more mm. perfect, but... How can you make life forms like that more or less perfect? It's just, I think interesting. Yeah. he's really, you know, as much as he wants to destroy the Daedra, he is bitter towards the Aedra for creating something with the potential to be infiltrated the way it was. You know, um, get, talking about the fact that the the Etada were fragmented and frail and, and they sought the wrong council and they created this realm where Meryn's Dagon could consistently come in and screw things up. And every time, now, now that the more I look into the complexities of his ideology, the more it actually does tie back to his childhood trauma. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, look at the, the butterfly effect, mm. effect there. It's, well, it's it interesting. Some people think that Mehrun's Dagon kind of knew what he could become potentially mm. and tried to kill him or knew 
what he would become and therefore kind of put him on this path at the, for whatever reason. At the very least, something sus is at play because either yeah, that yeah, happens it's very sus. or Vivek, you know, comes along and saves him. It, it's all a bit unusual. You know, I mean, there's conflict about when Vivek was even born, who was older and mm. all of that stuff. But... Uh, imagine if Dagon uh, actually knew that ultimately Sothisil would die if he could somehow see down the chain of cause and effect. Mm. And so there was something to it that benefited him. I, I'm not saying there's strong evidence for that. It's just a interesting food for thought. Interesting too, like, and obviously um, talking about the tribunal as a whole, like, you know, saying the dark health kind of skin that he bears and the forward thinking sort of thing. Whereas arguably you could look at Omalexia and go like, almost lo- looking kind of, not looking into the past, but I guess sort of maintaining, you know, the glory of of, of the golden age, that kind of time mm. and so on. And in the middle, there's sort of a vec. But funnily enough, I wonder if you could argue, make a point that, the one who has the the smallest ego of them all is actually Vivek, because what he instead craves is a multiplicity of of egos. He like the quote that so still says about him: Vivek craves radical freedom, the death of all limits and restrictions. He wishes to be all things at all times, every race, every gender, every hero, both divine and finite. But in the end, he can only be Vivek. But um, obviously, Amalexia's uh, ego or senses that that doesn't have to be um, clarified or so on. But because when you think more about Kim too, it's not, I guess maybe it's not even necessarily like you have to have, if you use ego in a strict sense of stick sense of self, but, um, whereas Vivek, I think it's, it's spoken here that basically his ability to, uh, Oh no, sorry. I think it's said about the prisoner and then theoretically how you could get to Kim, but being able to see, um, the contra- absorb the contradictions, I think, or take the, are you sure on. she'd be like have a less ego or is it just a so, less copes within her ego? Like it's easier sorry, to understand. Sorry, not Vivek. I'm Vivek would. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, in, in I know obviously he needs the ego to achieve Kim and not just kind of vanish from existence. But there is an element to seeking enlightenment that is somewhat the destruction of the ego as well. And it do, like the impression I always get of Vivek is is always that he's incredibly interested in all the in all the things he can discover all of the all of the information he can gather that is now accessible to him with these powers as opposed to making him the kind of god of everyone just, just th- to catch me up who who are you saying has the least ego sorry vivek. Uh, vivek, vivek not amalek so this is what um this is a uh it was a part of what you were talking about before where um you ask about amalexia he says defy simple analysis i doubt she could even describe herself accurately to understand amalexia you must first understand the value of fiction vivek fancies himself the poet but in truth am is the greatest storyteller if you say how so he says uh vivek knows the boundaries that separate fact from fiction he knows them so well that he's learned how to break them he exists inside his verse but recognizes the lies the contradictions so i feel like you kind of in terms of like that classic idea of like ego or so of yourself so you are delusional about yourself somewhat i'm the greatest i'm the whatnot he is both not like even if you look at the 36 lessons of vivek it's a giant confession um, hidden in, in, in secret messages that basically I killed Nerevar, I did this or so on. He both believes that he is this sort of like divine savior, but also knows he's this, you know, assassin who betrayed his friend kind of thing. Like, I think we can all agree that every member of the tribunal could use some therapy. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> their, their, <laughs> their minds are quite interesting, but that's what makes them such cool characters. Oh, absolutely. And And to also clarify, like, of course, you're going to have an inflated ego being a living god, no matter what. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. We're talking yeah. about degrees of which mm. and stuff, and yeah. I guess like uh, self awareness or understanding. Um, Could but, I just say as well, so the seal is really tall. <laughs> this yeah. is heaps random, but I loved that when you meet him in Elder Scrolls Online, um, and he's walking. He's just a presence. Mm. Again, as Drew was saying, he's not some big brawny warrior, but he just has that imposing kind of philosopher you know intelligent presence standing there in his robes at such height yeah it's it's the mystery of it and you know we're talking about the the degrees of ego and obviously Amalex's ego is is kind of the more surface level one if you have godlike powers you want to be seen and worshipped as a god which is where we've said before that she has parallels to azura whereas even though we've kind of established that there's definitely an ego involved for sofa sill the ability to be a recluse for centuries at a time when you have that kind of power 
um, is quite surprising, even perhaps, if that power has been waning somewhat. Perhaps, like, then maybe ego, like, maybe in parts, but maybe it's not the most accurate, because you could also, like, probably the tr- childhood trauma and sort of pain and perhaps even uh, running away from um, mm-hmm. pain in a way, like, he throws himself... Um, into his work and even when he knows ultimately that because he's so aware of determinism and causality that he's uh, it's kind of going to be fruitless it almost seems like Mm -hmm. he knows but he can't behave against it because he has to do it for her his sister he has to he do you know what i mean like he's locked himself into this sort of i think if he truly was pursuing nothing but perfection and the absence of limitation the absence of the patamaic he would inevitably go down the road of Jigalag. He'd inev- inevitably lose his mind and just be de- completely defeated by it. But having some kind of mortal traits involved, even if it's hypocritical, is kind of what allows him to keep striving towards something. Because to actually well, achieve kind of, you know, Anu, to achieve ineffable perfection, it's like, well, that's completely hopeless. Perhaps on a long enough time frame, he would have gone insane. Mm. It's it's interesting mm. to think that really, you know, as far as the Daedra go, um, he hasn't lived for that long. So he could have ended up like Jigalag given enough time. Mm. Yeah. You know, the Elder Scrolls timeline that we kind of look at lore within is quite small compared to how long Daedra, you know, have been around for and how they perceive time in general as well. Perhaps so I, it, yeah, I, I wouldn't be per- surprised if that and if Almalexia really freed him. Um, from a from a more of a bleak, insane existence further down the line. Who knows? Mm, I mean, uh, Amalexia Could- says, I've suspected for some time that the Lord Sofasil has entered Sheagorath's realm. <laughs> That's her perception <laughs> See- of him. But that's interestingly, she's also there trying to, I'm pretty sure there she's also trying to paint him because remember mm. she's trying to trick Manipulate, the narrative yeah. that like manipulates herself. So, but funnily enough, Vivek um, in a way could be um, one of the more self-aware, well, not self-aware, but self-accepting of like what's going to happen in ways like basically even his whole thing about he even helps the Nerevarine like he helps you acquire the tools and stuff defeat Dagothur and cut off his own divinity he kind of like almost has accepted his time mm-hmm. is over and Vivek accepted knows his fate. that the prophecy will be fulfilled yeah it's kind of he's he's but aware he's, and he he's even got, wrote the lessons to kind of you know where, whereas like help. whereas like Almalexia um absolutely did not accept and fought till a dying breath to maintain her power whereas so the Sil also didn't accept it. He just like looking forward, looking forward. I've got to find a way to go in the future and, you know, create some mechanical heart and all of that kind of stuff. Like he's still, you know what I mean? Rather than the sort of the acceptance of what is. I mean, they talk about, uh, I'm trying to forget which order it is, the, the whole enantiomorph concept again, which, like I said, is a pretty nebulous sort of idea anyway, because there's lots of variations on it. But one of the, the core ones is the sort of the rebel, the king and the witness. And there's the role in it. Sometimes they also refer as like, a catalyst is another thing, another like point. But anyway, it's not really relevant. But I'm pretty sure before it was um, Nerevar, the king, um, the uh, and the witness was Alandro Sul, and the rebel being the tribunal and the overthrowing um, of Nerevar. And in this instance, basically that that um, the king, I think it was Dagoth. I can't remember. Look, maybe I won't won't go down this loophole because I don't want to misrepresent it or so on. But um, but basically. Vivek's role in that whole thing was that he is the witness. He's resigned, like he's been in a different role, but a witness of the whole thing. And the witness is usually um, maimed or hurt or destroyed or something like that. So for example, in the the dynamic with the three many-headed Talos, um, you have Izmir, uh, Wolfarth, Tiber Septim, and, um, and Zuranarctus. And Zuranarctus being the like witness, getting, you know, saw Tiber Septim mm. to turn on them all and so on. And he got shot through the heart. And yeah, kind of dragged into this divinity. And yeah. there, I mean, there's there's elements, you know, if you just take witness further with Vivek that, you know, as we were kind of saying before, that he, he does just kind of really revel in the idea of kind of discovering more, the idea that he travels around um, Nern and, you know, he visits the he visits Akavir, he visits Yakuda. It's like there is a first for knowledge there beyond just achieving his own immortal goals. Here's, uh, here's something we could talk about that's kind of fun, right? So recently, um, we're playing the Anniversary Edition and there's the whole Ghosts of the Tribunal quest and, and that's sort of whether you take the um, how canon that is or, or, or whatever. The th- but the fact is now it's part of a sort of an official release so I kind of treat it with a little bit more 
just at least thought. But there's this idea, which is it's a totally believable idea that that there is cult still to Elms of E and they're, they're waiting for their return and all of that kind of stuff, right? And they're going to come back. But the idea that perhaps, and you know, in the way that worship, or at least how a lot of people understand the worship in the Elder Scrolls universe is that it's kind of, you know, worship drives the existence of a lot of mm-hmm. um, things. Whether they could still exist in this sort of god capacity being worshipped continually and then maybe there is some way of coming back there's a quote by vivek um in morrowind where he's talking about how he feels like going into the god realm is where he sees everything all at once and that there's everything's all happening at the same time Mm -hmm. and and so on when he's sleeping then he like wakes up but basically just talking about these different I, i sort of explore in the vivek explained video but there's an idea of like the god Vivek and the living god Vivek that you're seeing because when he goes he goes into this other time like this when he goes you know closes his eyes or whatever and enters the sleeping world where everything's all happening at once and you know the timeless realm of the gods it's the experience is different and the same as like Azura also references to this idea as well saying um, actually I find the exact quote it's um Maybe it's the other one. Hold on. Um, Yeah, what you have done here today is foul beyond measure and you will grow to regret it for the lives of gods are not what mortals think and matters that weigh only years to mortals weigh in gods forever. And that's her talking to the tribunal. But the idea that there is sort of... That implies that Azura is sort of experiencing that betrayal and stuff for all of time, and it's continuing and going through. And well, we know that this is this is huge conjecture, so we can just toss it out. But um, we know that Sofa Sil may potentially have an understanding of that as well, because when he spends time on Arte and with the Sigix, he enters this dreaming cave, and there's there's talk of him actually convening with some of the Daedric Daedric princes. And in the Truth in Sequence, there's a reference to kind of how he perceives. The passage of time so i mentioned before that he's forward thinking but in a sense it's not not exactly forward like I'll, I'll give you the quote first but he says think now on the wheel um the axle sleeps while the spokes make haste round and round in reflective circles now here dwells a nameless secret child of the tribunal does a thing move when it moves in circles so if you you, you can kind of use the mm. the ouroboros the the calpic cycle as an example of this but if something's moving in a circular motion like, like if you're seeing a car drive by and the wheels are moving fast, you don't really see the motion. It's kind of, it's, it's happening all at once. Um, and that's yeah. kind of similar to this, this idea that when you view it from a God's perspective, t- the timelines are flattened, time is flattened and you experience everything at once. It's like things are happening, mm. but you don't really feel any kind of passage. Yeah, I mean, that's a good way of um, thinking about it. Perhaps even... Maybe it's helpful to say instead of because time's such like a mortal kind of concept and you just like you know, young to old kind of thing instead experiencing or thinking of it in terms of just like causality. So even mm-hmm. that wheel, it's like a you know it's a chain of causality. But do you know how it's like if you say oh this is the chain of causality, you can imagine like entering in at any time and it's going to be what you expect. So you kind of know it all if you know the chain of co- yeah, causality. It's you can inevitable kind of and it will always move the exact same way so that it can mm. complete the circle as well. If you know And there's some really there's some really cool medicine. Like the stuff you were saying about the prisoner and the idea that you're these they're these these just rare exceptions to mm. to the chains of causality. Like the Elder Scrolls themselves like shift and change. But the idea that well you as the player can break the chains of causality and go fishing for 12 hours in your <laughs> Skyrim anniversary edition instead. But I, I really, I really appreciate that kind of like, mm. do you think so? The seal will come back. Oh, like, I don't, th- I don't in, think they in will. Living God story. form. No. He's got, um, because if there's anyone who would have himself backed up into a cloud, it's him. He's got mm. his, you know, pneumonic planisphere, um, in the clockwork city that holds, a bunch of his memories in the form of stars mm. and you could imagine that knowing i mean it's it's hinted or said that he knew almalexia would come and kill him yeah um he could have done a backup <laughs> system backup before he was killed you know i mean the idea and that he's the plugged memory... into that thing <laughs> memories and he's using soul gems and mm. all kinds of things and putting them in different places i, I wouldn't be surprised a, a individual as capable as him someone who was able to teach Sigic monks and 
you know, defy Daedra and things like this could possibly have their soul and memories hidden somewhere with the backup system in place with the mechanical heart keeping, you know, the water yeah. and the air and basic things going that he could somehow have a resurgence plan. In, I mean, in that sense, like in the form of his memory living on, I can definitely see that being the case, especially if his work wasn't complete and he wants the kind of... Uh, the clockwork city to continue to sustain itself if if there were to be another who took up the mantle like this theoretical daughter of his access to his not necessarily his spirit or his soul but his memories at the very least you'd expect or he could just put his own memories and stuff inside a factotum mm. and you meet him and he's just full on brass <laughs> <laughs> do you brass reckon he's, an, he's will... a numidium in a yeah. sense even though he hates <laughs> numidium do you think he's resigned himself perhaps to like well, like, well, he has resigned himself to causality and stuff. So the one aspect, I wonder if there is a way that his acceptance of his time will come. So with the Almalexia thing, so he might not. Like, yeah. I guess his mechanical heart was his way of going forward, but not about preserving preserving himself. I actually feel like, though, I feel like it's sort of that kind of situation where it's like blinded by determinism where it's mm. like everything is like fate and set so he can't see outside the possibility and I, I don't know i would i don't want to question a god or anything but if you can see that there are these prisoners these people that seem to exist almost outside the flow of fate would you not then sort of entertain the possibility of that like he's being so self-aware at the same mm. time if it's like yeah. oh i just can't do that, that I can't, that's I what's got the funny insight. again with tribunal members um sharing features but he's quite contradictory like Vivek mm. in the sense that, you know, he's living one reality while being aware of it, yet also of something that contradicts it entirely. Yeah. It's like it's... There's, a, there's a duality within Sothasil as well, I suppose. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, abs absolutely. And Elmalexi too. It's fitting for yeah. um, all of them. But yeah. Um one thing we haven't mentioned, and we should probably just should, is um, in in depth, I guess, is the whole um, Cold Harbor Compact mm. thing. Um, and I don't know what to think about some of the some. I get a little bit confused sometimes on the situation of what what the dealio is with Daedra and entering the world. Because like obviously, there's the, the Alicia sort of pact made with Akatosh, and then there's the Veil, so they can't enter or enter as strongly as they used it, it to. It wasn't I all Daedra. Um, it wasn't all of them, of the I know. Compact, that. So that's how Nocturnal... Um, yeah, I know. But I, what I'm thinking is it's like, okay, that contract, but then shouldn't the next contract or the next barrier or whatever, like the dragon fires, because at this time, Riemann's yeah. alive. Like, should they not be stopping it? I mean, it? there are constantly new... It, this is mostly obviously from ESO, but there are constant new additions of ways to bypass these rules, like Fargrave being a new addition where mm -hmm. anyone who discovers Fargrave can basically traverse oblivion and enter Nern under any circumstances ever <laughs> plus plus See, w where is the clockwork city really mm. because if nocturnal's attacking the clockwork city but not yeah you get what i'm saying like perhaps i think she's not pre prevented from kind of i think one thing there. to say too but to I think it would be fair to say that I think the whole dragon fires thing and the, the liminal barrier and so on it's is overplayed to what degree. Like, obvious, you know, you know what I mean? Um, but the, so that just to, to recap, with the Cold Harbor Compact, the reason it's called Cold Harbor Compact is because um, there was this town in Valenwood called um, that Merlock Bell destroyed called Gliverdale, and there's a whole bunch of fuss around that. But there was this big, terrible destruction and so on. And then basically, so the seal intervenes and he's like, You're, I don't want you to just the Daedric Prince is to just come in willy-nilly and only through, you know, in, have you work through intermediaries such as witches or sorceresses and, and, and stuff like that instead of just coming in and causing mayhem everywhere. Um, several of the, eight of the princes um, signed the compact. I actually want to just find the ones that did. Um, it was Azura, Boethia, Hermaeus Mora, Hercene, Malakath, Mayrins Dagon, Molag Bal, and Shea Gorath. But... Mayrin's Dagon just completely ignores this very, very soon after and, and comes because a, a witch summoned him and just flattens Mournhold where it's Sothis Sil and, and that have to, um, and uh, Almalexia have to fight him off. Um, oh yeah, there's, I'm trying to, I um, can't remember where I saw it now, so I don't know where to look for it, but there's, the, there's a, him beating him into submission with a bronze whip. So it's yeah, yeah, really so, like, such so a cool it's, description. Um, God bronze whips mm. to lash uh, Mayrin's Dagon into submission after Almalexia plunged her sword into him 
and then when Dagon was basically wounded and, and taking a lot of damage, Sothisil whispers Dagon's mimic to him, and then the prince, quote, exploded throughout all time. Mm. So he got his revenge in a way, but it wasn't enough. No. All the Daedra must die. Yeah, well, and, yeah. Like I said, I, the, like we were sort of taking at the start with the whole, saying at the start with the whole um the whole idea of him wanting to reconcile essentially Anu and Padabe, but the way he sort of seems is kind of remove the chaotic the limitation element and so on and make a perfected Tamriel he's naturally going to have a whether it's personally driven also also just project driven like it's happenstance but to him a perfection would be removing the Daedric element the Padamaic element of everything which is funny anyway when you consider that that um the tribunal's origin is obviously a Padamaic nature kind of thing, and they are a Padamaic culture. But the thing, too, to consider with that is you wouldn't call it a Nuic, I guess whatever word you would call the tribe worship of the tribunal. But um, the good Daedra worshipping sort of Ashlander point of view is far more Padamaic mm. um, but, than but does he really the Golden want, Age tribunal. Does he really want everything to be a Nuic? Like. Not well, a new It's, it's the, more because he. I mean, the quote is the unification of competing forces. Yeah, he he. So th- there's a line that says, and I think this is a big flaw in in their logic in general. But uh, it says, "Our lessers know the source as two forms, Anu and Padamai. But this binary is without merit. One of Lorcan's great lies meant to sunder us from the truth of Anuic unity. So, okay. and he goes on to say, there is no Padamai. Padamai is the absence of value." Whereas yeah. it's like, no, I, okay. I think that's wrong in the sense that you you can't really have value without the contrast of the chaos against the order. Yeah, because then you have no, like, sort of measure of how to yeah. determine that value without I mean, the, a thing the, that says but lesser also and greater. Even calling the Anuic part the, value, the valuable part is strange because it's kind of like they both just exist. Well, yeah, value is implied. Different isn't pa- it? It's, it's purpose. Yeah, like whatever... Um, they all have their purpose is basically what I'm trying to say. Mm. The yin and the yang. Yes. Uh, I would almost... Uh, you could argue that the manifestation of Tamriel and Nern, how it already is, is a unification of those forces. Which I don't is know what if... he's trying to achieve, right? Like I, it's, it's I the, it, Not unification, but it's an it's a interplay between them. Yeah, but I he, guess... If he wants to combine them fully, what does that actually look yeah. like? Yeah. So I guess because he recognizes that too, and that's part of the reason he wants Clockwork City is because um, uh, Mundus is a competition between Anuic and Padmaic forces, and then that interplay of the both. But rather, he's trying to create this different realm where it's like a balance of unified. the two without the interplay. But so it's, there's there's no competing forces; they just become one. Yeah, basically removing the mirror. It's just no enantiomorph. It is just just the thing. It's like a mag, but do you know how hard that is to conceptualize? Like sounds how pretty, to like put them together? Pretty, uh, sounds pretty boring. <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah. He's kind of against the idea of any form of collaboration ever working. You know, like a good way to sum it up is it says, a mechanism built by many hands cannot know the precision of the master craftsman. A perfect world without etard or gears, without the illusion of change, watertight and everlasting. So it's like in order to have perfection, it can only have one mastermind behind it. So the collaboration at the convention and all of that is just impossible for Mundus to ever be successful in his estimation. Mm. So, because of childhood trauma, blinded mm-hmm. by determinism and causality, he just locked himself into a fruitless task <laughs> for eternity. I, nice. I wonder who his father was. As well, yeah, pro- probably a bit says. of that missing as well. But, you know, he's a good bloke. Interestingly, because it's said that Vivek saved him, right? And I, I was... It's interestingly, like, obviously the 36... It, he gets placed in different spots because in the 36 lessons of Vivek, there's Set and IMR there before Vivek is because they, they, you know, he gets birthed from the Netchman's wife mm. and all of that kind of stuff. So how did he come around? But it's funnily enough, um, uh, Fanuit Hen um, verifies that he's met Vivek, he and his barons. So mm-hmm. in the quote, the first... Uh, the first one where it says um, seven Daedra came to her one night and one gave the egg new motions that could be achieved by certain movements um, of the bones. These are called the barons of move like this. Then an eight, eighth Daedroth came and he was demi-prince called Fanuit Hen or the multiplier, uh, multiplier of motions known. 
and funnel it uh, and said, whom do you wait for? To which the Nechman's wife said, the Hortator, go to the land. Okay, that's going on and on. But basically, um, there is a quote from funnel it Hen in ESO, um, who says that he met Vivek when he was young, he and his barons and so on. And it's, so it's not necessarily like, this is how it happened, but he did funnel it and did meet Vivek at young. So like, because the way I take the 36 lessons of Vivek, it's like highly metaphorical. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, there's this weird sort of, um, I explain it in the 36 lessons of Vivek and due to the nature of dragon breaks and all of that kind of stuff, that the world we exist in now is one where he was born a god. But because he created this, new existence this this new timeline in, in in the events where he is was born a god as opposed to in the old but he only created this new timeline by that dragon break moment where he does um kill nerevar and they steal from the heart and all that kind of stuff go go watch vivek explained for a greater yeah. clarification <laughs> on that but i think we could do videos um on both almalexia and sothasil there's definitely um in-depth stuff to be had to be said about them and explore. Um, but yeah, are there any more areas of Sotha Sill that we want to talk about? Oh, uh, one other like uh, aesthetic change. Like, I just want to clarify in the, obviously Morrowind three, they kind of like retcon land in Morrowind. He is a um, like, has like paler skin, like a Kaima kind of thing. And I feel like they retcon that. And I think it's a good idea to make him look like a Dunmer mm. in terms of Dunmer skin. But you see him by the end, he's like hooked up to a machine. He's like mostly replaced. Like, so in Sotha Sill, you see like he's got his like mask and he's got his mechanical arm and such. But by the end, he's really like replaced a lot of himself and turned himself quite mechanical. And he's got that kind of cool mask. The, um, I don't know, the, the big, yeah, almost like Babylonian or, or like uh, Syria, some Mesopotamian sort of looking like thing with the the beard thing mm. you know um but yeah that's another sort of like uh physical reflection of his like transition of time over um you know his f- i guess focus on the clockwork city and, and distance from from the plight of people as time went on but yeah um let's not forget that he still, they all murdered his, <laughs> their, their king, their best friend. Like, cause like yeah. that was Sotha Sil. He was like the um, magical sort of advisor to uh, Nerevar. Yeah. They were all part of it. They were all in on it. They were all flawed. Yeah. He had to kill his best friend to go and try and save the world, even though he knew it would be fruitless. He had to do it anyway. Yeah. Did, um, did I think Sotha Sil, if, if you had to give one of them more credit for wanting to betray Nerevar, I would give it to Sofa Sil. I, I, he seems calculated in that sense that there's a lot to gain from using the tools, and I, I think he would have had his eyes on them up, yeah, leading think, up to that moment. Yeah, there's even a there was a quote somewhere about good um, all the things I've... It's a saying along the... Oh yeah, yeah, the truth is that my actions, both good and evil, are inevitable, locked in time, determined by chains of action and consequence. Like, so he's very aware mm-hmm. of he's done bad things in the past and the whole... Um, uh, assassination. But yeah, him bringing the tools, um, Kagranak's tools, and the idea that he can go against Azura's thing. And he sort of had that kind of vendetta. I wonder how much... How him growing up with the whole Mayor and Dagon destruction of his home and so on and his sort of opinions towards the Daedra was sort of formulated and it probably came to its like zenith point when he did, does reject the good Daedra but before then he's all mm-hmm. you know like presumably like the rest of the Kaima have favorable opinions of Azura and so on like Nerevar was Azura's champion so he can't exactly have been b- before he gave her the finger you know what I mean mm-hmm. to but yeah well ladies and gentlemen I think that just about wraps up everything on Sotha Sill. And if we did miss anything, I'm sure it will be part of a, a video or something down the track. And we've got many we've got years. tribunal podcast episode at some point. Oh yeah, for sure. Cause, cause I think actually there's a lot to be gained to like talking about each specifically deeply. And then you can actually use a tribunal episode mm-hmm. to bring it all together in this one big uh, metaphorical. Yeah. I think keeping this focused on Sotha Sill helps because it's very easy to just kid you know to continuously draw the connections between the three of them so maybe hit yeah. all of them and then we can talk about the way they interact and their society that they create yeah all right well social media links are in the description and we look forward to nerding out with you again very soon <laughs>